everybody to a remote version of Holly Randall Unfiltered. Please bear with me as I have never done this before, but if you live anywhere in the world, you know that right now we are dealing with a serious um, virus going around called the coronavirus. You might've heard of it. And we all have to stay in our houses. But I didn't want to interrupt your flow of podcasts, and I also wanted to have somebody on um, during this time period, just so that we could talk about something current that's affecting us all. So I have the wonderful Kate Kennedy on, who is recording from her own home. Kate, hi. How are you? I feel like that's such a funny question to ask people right now. I know, right? (laughs) I just feel weird. I was like on the phone with my doctor earlier today, like ordering a prescription remotely. And I was, he's like, how you doing? And I was like, I'm good. How are you? And I was like, I'm sorry. I asked that. Like, there's no yeah. possible way you're well right now. Um, yeah. But all in all, I'm doing good. I'm at my home, obviously, because yeah, we're in the middle of a global uh, crisis, catastrophe, pandemic, lots of fun names for this. It's crazy, right? It, it really doesn't feel... Like I wake up every day and I'm like, this can't be real. Like, this can't be happening. This isn't happen- a thing that happens. No, I know. Like, it definitely doesn't happen to us Americans. No, definitely. And like, it not- happens to somebody else. <laughs> right. And like, not within our lifetimes either. No. Like, the like Spanish flu. Like the last time this happened was literally a hundred years ago. We're setting a timer, people, so we don't just go crazy and talk willy nilly forever. Can't have that. Which I do um, all the time. I was live uh, on Instagram for like four hours last night. <laughs> really? I, you know, I go live on Instagram and mm-hmm. I'm so boring. First of all, it's very hard for me to sit down mm-hmm. and just like talk out into the ether. Um, it's really without, hard. Yeah. Like without someone to speak to. Like I can mm-hmm. kind of do this with you. I much prefer to do in-studio interviews because I like totally. to have the person in the room and like feed off their energy because otherwise I get distracted really easily. But As we've said before, we don't have a lot of options here. Um, But yeah, like, so whenever I do Instagram live, I have to be like cooking or like that's what I was doing. That forces me to be in one place. Yep. And then after about 15 minutes, I realized like, I don't really have anything to say that's particularly (laughs) interesting. Like, I've already promoted everything that's going on. I've plugged my shit and I'm done. So bye. I just figured I was like, you know what? I'm not doing anything. I'll turn it on and like drink some wine. And I was like listening to Dolly Parton and like dancing around. And I was like, we'll just be dumb. And like people can ask me questions. I do like a bunch of like Q&A like on all Mm -hmm. my platforms. Like I'll go and be like, especially right now because I just don't have anything to do. Right. And so um, I just was like, and occasionally I'll like interact with it and be like, oh, no, no, like check it and answer somebody. Um, but yeah, I was watching it back this morning and I was like, what? I was like, who was watching this? Like a ton of people were, I was like, I don't, I guess everyone's bored. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Um, and speaking of, you know, we were kind of talking earlier before we started the show. Um, I've had a lot of people ask me like, how is this affecting the porn industry? And I'm like, well, yeah. um, it's affecting us kind of like in the same way it's affecting everybody else. Like mm-hmm. we can't shoot. Yep. Um, but we are also very fortunate that we are basically like online smut peddlers. Yes. <laughs> and nobody has anything to do but be online and maybe consume some smut. So yeah. And especially like it's it coincides with the personal podcast the personal um, content platforms, which is kind oh, of yeah. like a new thing anyways. So I think most like sex workers are better off in this scenario than a lot of other people are. And like, that's been my kind of thing from the get go with this, where it's like, I, and I've been like super vocal about it online too. Like I was quoted in like the daily mail saying this, I was like, wow, what an asshole do I sound like? Where I was like, (laughs) if you're trying to sell porn, like having the entire world stuck at home with nothing to do is kind of a dream scenario. Yeah. Because when people are bored and they're panicked and they're scared, they jack off. Yeah. Like that's just human nature. That's what we do. And like, so stress reliever, it's totally is. So like my numbers have gone way, way up this month Same to the point. I think I've made in the last like two weeks since this started, my earnings are up four times from what they were a month ago. Yeah. So like, I've been kind of trying to be like, you know, first of all, just 
being grateful and like acknowledging like the privilege of having a job like this. Right. I'm also like a little like I kind of want to call my mom and be like, who's who's laughing now? Like, <laughs> I built a pandemic proof business that operates out of my studio apartment alone. And I make yeah. like and I'm making all of this money. Like I was like, I I told you. Like I told you this would yeah. work. Um, it's funny because they've always said that like the three things that are recession proof are alcohol, cigarettes, and porn. Mm-hmm. Who knew? they were also pandemic proof. Exactly. There. And honestly, like I obviously I don't like predict the future, but like I did kind of think something, obviously not this exactly, but I sort of thought four years ago when I first started to kind of get into the adult industry, I was, cause it was right after Trump was elected and I was like, something's going to happen. Yeah. Like all of a sudden everything feels really destabilized. I was like, I'm going to go do the thing that I know is going to be recession proof. Right. Like I'm going to go after this because one, I'm interested in it anyways, but that was a huge deciding factor in getting into the adult industry for me was that like, I mm-hmm. came of age during the great recession. Like that was when I was in high school. I saw my parents' friends lose their job. I kind I grew up very much with like that idea of like, this is not stable like mm-hmm. working for someone else and in trying to like have a company job, that's not how things are going to go. Mm-hmm. And I graduated college right as this was all happening. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go make my own money in like the most stable way that I know. And that was boring, right. but it worked. So actually that leads me to the question I was going to ask mm-hmm. you, kind of ask all my guests, because people yeah. like to know a little background. Um, how did you get into the adult industry? I know you you kind of sort of just told us your story, but maybe like, you know, how you got your toe, like dipped your toe into the murky water. I was doing, so I had, I graduated from college. I went to CU Boulder um, in Colorado and I studied uh, advertising and art history. So I have a background in digital media strategy and branding, like Mm -hmm. specifically. And I was trying to get a job. I could not get a job in my field to like save my life in Colorado. Um... And I was doing lifestyle BDSM at the time. So I like worked part time at a dungeon and I like traveled around the country and I taught classes about like different kinds of kink and BDSM okay. and like polyamory education and stuff like that. So it's already like, a little more specific about that because that's interesting. Yeah, it's super interesting stuff. So I had gotten into it in college just because I personally like BDSM. On, and- on which end? Both ends or? Um, so I'm kind of a switch. I can be a little toppier with women, but I'm generally submissive. Okay. Um, and it was just something I'd wanted to pursue. And I went through like a bad breakup and was single and I was like, fuck it. Like I'm going to go to this club and I ended up making all these friends and it just turned into this huge part of my life, Mm -hmm. um, in my early twenties. And I, uh, so I was kind of doing all of that. I ended up going up to Portland to do a kink fest and which is like a big convention. And while I was there, my friend was shooting for Insects, which is a porn company up there. Really? Um, I, I used to date a Dom and Insects was his favorite website. It's it, it's, it's been around forever. Yeah, they used to do some crazy shit. They got shut down by the FBI. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I had London River on and she talked about a scene that she did where they mm-hmm. sewed her vagina shut. Yep. Yeah, I remember that. that. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. They did one with like eyelid speculums on her. Yeah. They like held her. It was crazy. I got waterboarded for them one time. (laughs) Um, But I ended up, I was up there and like, they were really nice. I didn't really think anything of it. I was not shooting at that point. Um, But like a couple months later, they emailed me and were like, hey, we need a new marketing and affiliate manager. You're already in this world. Would you be interested in working in the adult industry, like behind the scenes? And I was like, yes. Mm-hmm. That sounds I had like a shitty job at like doing like billing for a medical clinic and I hated it. I made no yeah. money. I was like in a dead end relationship. I was like, fuck it. Like, sure, I'm gonna move to Portland. That sounds amazing. So I went up there and I worked there for like a year. Um, and I PA'd, I did camera, lights, photos, like a little of everything. It was a small staff. And I learned a ton about it. And I was like, you know, this is cool and I want to keep doing this. And I realized I could make more money in front of a camera. Um And so I was like, all right, cool, let's do it. So I started shooting. I came down to LA like once or twice before I moved down here. And then I ended up moving here two years ago in July. Mm -hmm. And I've been performing full time ever since. Okay. Can you tell us about your first scene and what that was like? 
My very first scene ever was for insects because I shot for all of their sites before I did right. anything mainstream. And those are actually like under another name too because I was so brand new. Um, I was really excited because I'd been like behind the scenes, you know, in my like cargo pants and hoodie for a year. Yeah. Like, you know, not being the center of like attention and in the camera. And so I like got up that morning. I was like, it's porn day. It's porn day. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was so stoked. And um, it was really fun. It was like a rope scene and I got all tied up and I had a great time. And then when I came down to LA and like my first like boy girl scenes, um, I was a little, I was intimidated. I was nervous. Yeah. Like I had already been around so many people in the industry because we had these girls, the models coming up like two or three a week. Right. So I already knew a ton of people, which was really nice. I already knew my first boy girl scene was with um, Jake Adams. Oh, he's awesome. I know. And we were already friends too. Like I already been to his house. Super helpful. Yeah. Yeah. It was really good. It was for Archangel with Liddell. Liddell. Okay. Who I I love. I know of him. Yeah. I think I've actually met him like a couple. I think I've met Mm -hmm. him. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry. I don't remember everybody exactly. You meet so many people in this industry. Like it's impossible. Um, yeah. but it was, yeah, it was a great experience and I just kind of like went from there. And, uh, so I, I was never like nervous. I was always a little intimidated and like wanted to like pay my dues and build my career up. I didn't want to be one of those girls that gets into porn and is like, I'm hot shit and I know everything and fuck, like I can definitely do this. Like I wanted to be like, okay, I'm, I have to learn about this. Like, I've always approached it like a business, and I think it's because I came in on the business end of it. It's also for, really fortunate that you were able to work behind the scenes first. So, like, you really understood the business as a business oh, yeah. before coming in just cold and, like, you know, not being – knowing any of these people, and you have all these lights right. on you, and they're like, okay, I have sex with this random person, and you're just like, mm-hmm. okay. You know what I mean? Like, I think having that experience behind the scenes must have been incredibly helpful. It was, I would recommend it to, I mean, those jobs are really, really hard to get. And that was something that even when I was leaving to go perform, they had said, you know, like, it's very difficult. There's very few jobs like that. Um, But if you can get one and you're interested in performing, like that's the best performer education you can get is to spend a year behind the scenes. Because not only are you seeing like, you know, you see the best of models that come and are so prepared and are wonderful to work with and you can learn a ton from them. You also yeah. see like what not to do. Yeah. Because um, I think I'd probably watched like at least 10 people's careers end by the time I started. I think one of the really important things is that you see the way that it's monetized and you can understand how we're making money doing this. Right. And so you understand like that aspect of it because if you don't and you just come into performing, like all you know is being in front of the camera and doing that job. And that aspect of my job is not the most lucrative of Mm. all of the things I do. Um, And it's not the one that makes you necessarily the most successful because if you're playing this game of being like, I have to be the hottest, biggest boobs, biggest butt, nastiest, most extreme, like you're never going to win that game. Yeah. There's always going to be someone ahead of you. So you have to understand the business aspect of it because then you can know how to brand yourself and build a career that's sustainable. Right. And that feels authentic and that it's yours, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that is the case now more than ever because the way that porn is distributed has changed so Mm -hmm. much. Yes. You know, um, now that models have direct access to their fans and and people Mm -hmm. can feel connected to their favorite girl. It's so much more about how you look and how you perform. Oh, totally. Because so much more now can be in your own control. Mm -hmm. You can control so much of your own career. So like it's the power has shifted just from like the hottest girls who can suck the biggest dick to like the smartest girls who can market themselves properly. Mm -hmm. Totally. And like, and I mean, it's awesome to be like those really hardcore, like those performers are amazing. I love working with them. Like they're so, but like I knew from the get go, I was like, I'm not going to be one of those people. Like I'm just not. And that's okay. Like, you don't have to be the way that we think of, like, a porn star to be really successful in this business. And most people that are really successful are not yeah. the way, we, like, our perception or um, stereotypes. So, yeah. And I think it's, it is interesting. And it's so, to me, like, and I preach this, like, all fucking day long to, like, new girls is, like, shooting your own content and taking 
the like control over your brand and what is being put out there of you and about you is empowering. Yeah. Like it's empowering financially because it makes you independent and not relying on studio shoots. It's empowering because it's your image and being able to have the kinds of sex that you like Mm -hmm. and want to with the Mm -hmm. people you like. You know, when you're a professional performer, your job is to go play a role and be someone else's fantasy. And that's fine. Yeah. Totally fine. But if you don't develop like the other aspects of your own, I mean, it's your own sexuality and your own sex life. Right. And if you are just constantly being somebody else's, that is going to have a toll on your psyche. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think also too, fans really recognize and connect with people who are authentic to their own sexuality. Totally. Like they can tell, like there are some very popular performers who I adore and obviously I won't name names, <laughs> but like they don't love sex that much. And fans can tell and they comment about it all the time. They're like, dude, she doesn't like sex. Like, right. whereas someone like Adriana Chekchik, there's no one on this planet that can say that that girl doesn't like sex. You know, I what bring I mean? her up as an example all the time of someone oh like and, and Angela, you know, like Angela yeah. White. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, they love what they do. Like, right. Clearly. And fans love that because I think people, you know, especially as, um, as you know, we're trying to really strip away the stigma from porn. We want yeah. people who watch and consume porn to feel good about what they're watching. We want people, you know, we're trying to, to erase that shame around porn. Mm-hmm. So we want people to feel like I'm watching somebody do something that they really love. Yes. Like they are enjoying this as much as I'm enjoying watching it. And so I don't feel like I'm contributing to something that's exploitative and that kind of thing. Cause there's still so many people who don't really understand how much porn has changed and they just, you know, abide by that same old stereotype that like every woman is a victim. Everyone's being yep. exploited. Nobody really wants to be doing it. And you know, that couldn't be further from the truth. Obviously there's cases no. where that does exist. It's never a hundred percent, but that's definitely like, that is, that is changing so much. So, and I think the thing people don't understand about that whole like victimhood narrative thing too is one, like, I don't know how else to tell people, like, I'm absolutely fine. I've had this yeah. conversation with my own parents so much. I'm like, I don't know how to tell you this. Like no one is exploiting me. But also, like, if I wanted, theoretically, if I was thinking like a criminal and I wanted to, like, exploit a girl, doing it in professional porn would be the most inefficient, stupidest way to do that. Like, it (laughs) it took me, like, three years of, like, ass-busting work to get a mediocre level of success. Like, I'm I'm very much a middle-tier performer, which I'm fine with, but, like, it is an enormous amount of work. I mean, like you like talk about someone like Angela White. Angela White's been doing this for like 15 years. Yeah. Like it it would be the most colossal waste of your time as a human trafficker <laughs> to try to like traffic someone into studio porn in 2020. Like I can't even imagine. Like I know that's what makes me so that. crazy when you know mm-hmm. you see cuz the easiest way for people to drum up hysteria around porn, mm-hmm. especially in the political sphere, is to use like human trafficking. Right. Because that's like, you know, everybody just thinks of like Liam Neeson and like Taken, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like if you really believe that every girl in porn is sex trafficked, you don't understand porn at all. At all. At all. Like you don't even understand human trafficking because the vast majority of human trafficking ha- happens in like domestic and agricultural labor. Yes. Like sex trafficking is a tiny, tiny part yes. of human trafficking. And like we really should be talking about the millions of other people that actually are being trafficked. Yes. And those people are like your maids and your gardeners and like the people that pick your food. And yeah. those people are actually victims in many cases. And those are the people we should be trying to help. Yeah, but that's not sexy trafficking. Not sexy. We want to talk about sexy trafficking. You know, we want to get like up in arms about something that has to do with sex and that just solidifies, you know, our preconceived notions that like any woman who's involved in the sex industry is there by force and that women don't have any kind of real sexual desires and they don't have agency over their careers and 
basically that women are not sexual creatures. Yeah, exactly. That women, yeah, that women don't like sex. There's something wrong about liking sex if you're a woman. And that was something that I dealt with, like, I mean, as a teenager, like, I grew up very, very Catholic um, and, like, very repressed in that way. And I, when I started to, like, explore my sexuality, like, as a teenager and was just trying to figure out, like, what I'm into and stuff, like, I had that moment of being, like, maybe I'm a bad person. Mm-hmm. Like no one's ever going to love me. I'm broken. Mm-hmm. Like, and it took me so long and it took me getting into BDSM and like meeting all these people that were, and it's been very similar in porn too, like that are successful and that are happy and have good lives and relationships. And like, that's not the truth. But if any, if all everyone tells you your whole life is that that's the case, that these women are all victims and that you can't like sex as a woman and it's gross and dirty and wrong, that's what you're going to believe. Right. Right. And and growing, you know, I mean, as children, we obviously believe what our parents tell us, Mm -hmm. right? Because we don't know any better. And it's so hard to rewrite what we grew up believing. And I mean, so personally, like, I'm super fortunate because, you know, obviously my parents parents were awesome. Yeah. (laughs) And my mom slept with everybody. (laughs) And they were very sexually open. They were swingers. And my mom always told me, like, the human body's beautiful. So, like, I grew up with zero shame around sex, like absolutely none. Um, so I've never had to deal with that, yeah. but I just can't imagine what it's like to be in a place where, you know, you have to like spend your whole life trying to over undo the teachings that you had as a child. Um, and your, your shame around your sexuality, because it's one of the biggest driving forces behind human behavior, which is probably why we feel like men, especially not all men, just saying, um, feel like they need to control it. Yeah, totally. You know? Yeah. Cause it is, I mean, it's a huge part of our brains. It's a part of our lives. It's biologically the thing we're put here to do. Yeah. So like literally like, what is the meaning of life? You're here to fuck. You're here to fuck. And like, that is what mother nature wants you to do is just walking that down and being like no just actually we can like control that like within ourselves and not like no like that is just a recipe like shame in general is suppressing anything like that it's just gonna bubble up through the cracks and it's gonna come Mm -hmm. out bad bad it's gonna it's like shame is this like toxic poison and you just are like pressing this thing down and it's gonna come up in these mutated not healthy ways and yeah, then you like have to go back and correct that as an adult. Like, I mean, and I, I did a ton of work on it. I spent hours and hours in classes learning about this kind of stuff yeah. because like, I recognized and I'm very, very glad that I recognized it young. I was, you know, like 20, 21 when I was like, shit, I got to go like address this. This was mm-hmm. not right the way that I was taught to think about this. And if I don't go learn about how can I express my sexuality in a healthy and safe way, I'm, I'm going to end up getting hurt. Right. You know, like it, it, cause it really was too, because I'm someone that is attracted to like extreme sex and I do, Mm -hmm. I do it so much less now too. I almost feel like it was weirdly like a phase, (laughs) like the weirdest kind of teenage rebellion ever. No, but that makes so much sense. You know, you yeah. were denied all of these things and you were, mm-hmm. you know, made to believe that all of these things were bad. And so you want to explore. I mean, you know, like yeah. people, human beings always want what they can't have. Right. Totally. Yeah. So, like you got to go out there and, you know, we all have our sexual experimentation phase, mm-hmm. you know, totally. But I just realized that too, like I realized that the things that I was doing like with partners, one, I was not communicating well because I didn't know how to. I didn't have like the tools to right. like because these are all – they're it's their tools. And if you don't learn them, you don't have anything in your toolkit, you're not going to be able to like establish consent in like a right. solid way. You're not going to be able to ask your partner or communicate like, hey, I'm into this thing, which can be a really scary thing to do. To like Mm -hmm. have because we have so much shame like around our sex. Like I remember like asking one of my boyfriends like tie me up for the and I just went about it totally wrong. It was awful. We got in a huge fight and it was that was like one of those moments for me where I was just like shit. I got to go learn how to do this because I'm Mm -hmm. either gonna have terrible sex for the rest of my life that I hate and isn't fun, or I'm gonna keep pursuing trying to get what I want and I'm not gonna be doing it the correct way. And -hmm. especially when you're doing stuff like BDSM and like extreme sex, like you can get hurt. 
Absolutely. Like, you know, so um, I think They're that extreme I mean, tests that you're putting your body through. Totally. I mean, you're doing yeah. stuff that can be like that was a, one of the classes that I used to help teach um, was on like extreme edge play. And like, how do you mm-hmm. do something that has a high risk? And how do you like right. establish consent for it? And <laughs> um, <laughs> and and talk about it and communicate it with your partner and like those kinds of things. Like, I just I think they're beneficial to everybody, even if you're not like wanting to like throw on a ball gag and tie up your boyfriend. Like, they're just they're good for everyone to know because it makes your relationships with other people better. Yeah, I mean, communication mm-hmm. just in general is something oh, totally. that you know human beings are not always the best at, especially if you weren't taught to talk about certain things. And sex is one of those things that we just don't talk about. Yeah. And so most people were raised to not talk about sex. Mm -hmm. And so obviously they're going to have no idea how to communicate what they like and what they don't like. And so then, you know, people get into these relationships and they don't talk to each other about what they're into. And then they feel shamed about the things that they like. And then maybe they go out and they seek that release through other people or yep. through other communities or online. And then their partner finds out and feels betrayed. But it's like, there's been that block about sexual communication there since mm-hmm. the beginning. And you guys have never broached the subject because mm-hmm. it's just too awkward. Yeah. You know, movies have taught us that like, we should just like know what right. you, each other wants. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like every sex scene is just this, you know, like perfectly in sync cinematic, you know, like shallow depth of right. field, candles in the foreground. You're going to wrap know, yourself in lighter. Afterwards. I've never done that in my entire life. Yeah. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> no one's ever done that. No man has just like an extra flannel just sitting right there for you to like yeah. casually drape over yourself and look amazing in. Yeah. Like, and I don't look good after I finish having sex. Like after I get off of set, I'm just like, Oof. Like, yeah. And everybody always comes at the same time. To be fair, everybody always comes at the same time in porn too. So can't really hate on that uh, right. fantasy part because we're not always like totally authentic it is so- in our scenes either because we are also producing a fantasy. Most We very much are. And I think that's one of the things that like people, I think people get more and more now. And I think like we were saying with the way that porn has changed and the way that it's like marketed and so much of it is by the performers mm-hmm. themselves now that I think that aspect of porn is changing. I think more people are, it's dawning on them that like, oh, like studio produced porn is a fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but like yeah. you don't watch Spider-Man and go jump off your roof. Like that's yeah. a really horrible idea. Like, yeah. Yeah, you don't like watch Fast and Furious and then just like drag race your Mazda. Like that's a horrible plan. <laughs> and, um, and the things that we do, it's like being an athlete. Like I've always compared it to being an athlete. And it's a lot like like I always it's like Michael Jordan like playing a pickup game of basketball or playing like in the NBA finals. And like yeah. it's the same game, but the motivation is totally different. Yeah. And the way you're going to play is totally different. And so, like, if you're someone that – and I'm not comparing myself to I'm, – I'm the Michael Jordan of porn. Wow. What a thing. <laughs> what a thing to say. Wow, Kate. Way to, like, yeah. really think highly of yourself. I know. I'm just too my own word. Um, but, uh, you know, like, when you are – if you're able to do something like that and you, you're going to do it at, like, a professional level, it is totally different. It's not that it's not fun or cool or exciting, but it's it's totally different. And yeah. like when I'm on a porn set and I'm performing for someone else, I'm not thinking about myself or my orgasm. That's like the last thing on my mind. I'm thinking yeah. like, how are we going to transition into the next position? Am I opening up for camera? Does the light look right? Like, is my hair in a weird place? Like I'm, I'm thinking actively through the entire thing. Right. And I'm also having to look like none of that's happening. Yeah. Like that's a very yeah. difficult thing to be able to do. Yeah. Somebody once compared porn to, they're like, everybody thinks porn's like MMA, but it's really like WWE wrestling. Like it's just, you know what I mean? Like a lot of it is not like those, those acts that look really extreme. There's a way to do them where it's not as extreme as it looks. Yes. And it's going to like, and it's safe, but if you try to do it at home and I tell you this all the time, like, don't, there's no fucking reason anyone needs to do pile driver. Outside of forever. Like, the worst position. So uncomfortable. Hurts your neck. No one looks Nobody good in gets it. off. 
Yeah. No. It's like, like it, it's just the worst. It's the worst. I hate that. It but looks it's funny so because when cool. I, yeah, but when I shoot it, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah this is great. Just because it's different. You know what I mean? Yep. But like in real life, I'm like, that's so dumb. Yeah. I'm like, just don't even try. Like have honestly, like the, my favorite positions are like missionary and doggy. Like that's all you really just, that's it. That's what you need. Like you don't need to do these other things. And not only that, like it won't feel cool. So even if it does, like for some reason you're able to like pull off a great amateur pile, you're not going to enjoy it. Yeah. Like it's not, there's just no reason. And you can't see yourself doing it. So you're not even going to get yeah. the enjoyment of, of watching yourself. So like, yeah, it's just one of those things where it is, it's a fantasy, but I like to being able to do my own content and like shooting back to that, shooting with people that I like, like at my house, like my friends and not worrying about opening up and just enjoying it. And like, to me, that kind of porn is so hot. Like that's what I watch. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you're like involved in it. Yeah, totally. Okay. We're going to take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q and A's where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. All right, we're back. So um, the reason I'm wearing my headphones right now is because we realized that like some of Kate's audio was bleeding into mine. Also, my camera stopped recording. So the last couple of minutes of what we were talking about will be just Kate. Um, so sorry, people. I did warn you that, you know, this is something that we are not used to doing and there's going to be little, little glitches, but we're doing the best we can under the circumstances. I feel like this pandemic is forcing us all to learn so many new skills. Yes. Will, like I have personally learned so much about so many things in the last two weeks, like audio recording, like seeing every, like uh, editing, like I just, cause now I have time to do it. And also now I can't like go out and have someone else do it. So I have to do it myself. Yeah, this is true. Um, I will say that like one thing about this whole, uh, pandemic quarantine is that my greatest fear is that it's going to mm. make me lazy. Um, mm. because I haven't set an alarm in like two weeks, which is crazy. I, I love that part. I normally go to the gym every day. I can't, I was going hiking almost every day. I can't do that either now. So I started doing like online yoga, but it feels very, um, it just feels not that much of a workout. Yeah. And we've just been cooking a lot. Uh, I tried to bake a cake, which was a disaster. And um, I'm taking a lot of naps. Yep. And I'm just, I'm worried that like when we have to go back to work, I'm not going to want to go back to work. I'm going to be like, <laughs> oh, fuck that. <laughs> I've actually been like at first, like, and I've had a couple bad days. Like there's been a couple days where I'm like, okay, this is hard. And I'm worried. And my anxiety is really high. And I, I'm like worried about my grandma and my parents and stuff because they're older. And there's been a couple bad days, but overall, like, and I think partially it's because I do the vast majority of my work at home. Mm -hmm. So like my, it's almost like I feel now like, oh, I can get so much more done 
because it's not being punctuated by like having to go shoot a scene and having to go do a comedy show. And it's like, I just have this extended period of time where I definitely don't have to do anything so I can get all of these other projects that have been sitting like on my docket for the last six months. And I basically just made a list of everything that I've been putting off and just boom, 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 like one at a time going through and doing it. See, that's the thing. Like, I feel kind of guilty because, you know, I'm reading these, you know, tweets about people being like, Mm -hmm. oh, now is a great time to reorganize your closet, like declutter your desk. Mm -hmm. And I haven't done any of that shit. (laughs) Like, absolutely none of it. Like, I have been working and I have been doing stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, So, but I just, I don't know. I'm also like a huge overachiever and I'm always like, I always feel like I don't do enough. Um, I'm the same way. <laughs> so part of me is trying to just, I don't know, embrace the time off. Oh, totally. I think to that's okay a about it. Really good usage of it. Somebody was saying, because like I also, and it's so silly, because like I am, I, I feel better when I do things. Like mm-hmm. I'm a very, I'm just a naturally very productive person. Like that's what keeps my yeah. mental health in check is doing stuff. But yeah. like somebody had said, I hate the cult of productivity. Like I hate this idea that we're just supposed to yeah. be working all of the time and mm-hmm. and monetizing all of our hobbies and you can't just like do something fun. So I do love that people are like doing jigsaw puzzles and baking cakes and like doing – I think especially in LA where you're just so conditioned to like how is this a side hustle? Let's do this side and then this. And like – so I think money off of this? <laughs> yeah. Like oh, this is so – like I painted a picture. This is so fun. I should open an Etsy store. And just make it not fun at all. Um, make it a job. Uh, right. Yeah. Just turn everything into a job. So I do think it's really good that people are just enjoying. But like I saw somebody tweet. They're like, dude, all you have to do right now is survive. Yeah. Like this is an emergency. And like if you are getting out of bed every day, like just put on – sometimes the best thing you do is get out of bed and put on clean pajamas. And that's okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I have, I yeah. have to say too, so like – you know, I'm a recovering alcoholic and mm-hmm. I, all of my meetings have been shut down. All my AA meetings, they're all on zoom, which I'm like totally mm-hmm. not attending because I'm so lazy. <laughs> um, so like, I've been really bad about that, but I've been thinking, cause I knew that there were some mm-hmm. new people that I knew that were trying to get sober. Like what an incredibly impossible time to get sober because this oh. is the best time to stay home and drink all day. Oh, totally. And part of me feels kind of jealous because I see all these people like day drinking and like fucking like smoking tons of weed. And I'm like, I want to drink all day. And, like I was doing all that when I had a job and had shit to do. And now that like I don't have those things, I'm like sober. I'm like, this is stupid. <laughs> I know that has been like a really serious thing because I've been seeing a lot of and a, a lot of people in porn are sober um, yeah. and have gone through that like I could tons of performers are and so I've been seeing a lot of those tweets too of people being like I'm freaked out like I can't go to my meeting I can't go to therapy like those are serious things that now it's like oh shit we have to like reconsider the way we're able to do those. But yeah, it definitely is like I was, you know, talking to one of my guy friends who's in New York. So they're totally shut down. Yeah. And like, they've just been, he's like, I don't know how any of us get out of this not being functional alcoholics. Like hopefully we're still functional, but this is. Yeah. I know. I wonder how many people are like going to come out of this just like serious, like with serious um, addiction Mm -hmm. issues and thinking about like how full all the rehabs are going to be after this. (sighs) Dude, I yeah, and I like can't imagine too like thinking about like we have we already have like an active like epidemic like we have the opioid epidemic like right. in our country already like right. how are those people like if you can't leave your house and you're now suddenly forced to like detox from heroin during a pandemic? Oh, I can't imagine. Yeah. That's I mean no. horrific. Like I don't. I'm a very like I grew up around like you know people drinking. I've been drinking for like a long time but I've always been very like safe about you know Mm -hmm. like I try not I overdo once in a while as does everybody but I'm pretty good at pumping the brakes so I'm like okay I think I'll be all right like yeah you know but well the funnest thing about drinking is overdoing it sometimes (laughs) you know otherwise like why I do it's overdoing it all the time is when it becomes a problem but like there's nothing wrong with like I mean why drink to get drunk dude why else would yeah I don't understand (laughs) feel like I have one beer. I'm like, okay, just calories. Right. Yeah. Especially. Yeah. 
I gained so much weight when I started doing stand up because I mean, not so much. I gained like five pounds, but I was like going to bars every night and like you always yeah. have to buy a drink. So I'd buy a beer because like it's, you know, I'm obviously not going to like slam vodkas and like try to go yeah. talk in front of people. That's a horrible yeah. idea. Um, yeah. So I was like drink. I was having like three or four beers a night and then I like got on the scale and I was like, oh shit. I was like, I make my money getting naked. Like I got to cut it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. So actually that that's a wonderful segue into your other career path, um, which we did talk about briefly before. So if you guys don't know, um, I had Kate on for a very brief little like 10, 15 minute interview at the AVN mm -hmm. show. Um, and we did talk about her comedy a bit. So if you want to like delve more into that, you can go back and watch that. Um, but you know, we're going to talk about it again. Um, we talked about my great fear of stand-up comedy after my yes. traumatic experience summer at summer, summer camp, <laughs> <laughs> which I won't go into again because you could just go back and, you know, listen to the other interview and you should, it's a but, good story. Uh, hilarious. Yeah. It's just, I'm just not funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really what it comes down to. So how did you get into comedy? So I got in, I got my first stand up show that I ever did. Like I'd wanted to do stand up since I was like probably 12. Mm -hmm. And it was just not like comedy, like entertainment, anything. I always wanted to be like in that world where I am now. Um, but <laughs> that was so far removed. Like I grew up in like a fairly small town in like rural Colorado. My parents are not entertainment people. Like they would always be like, you know, it's for other people. It's not for us. Mm -hmm. We're not like they, you know, they wanted me to like teach school, be a mom. Like that was and not in a bad way, not in a negative way. Just that was so far removed from my reality that like it didn't even dawn on me that I could try. Mm -hmm. And it took a long time and like moving out here and getting into porn and being like, oh, wait, actually, like I can perform and I am good at this and I like it. And it's people are now telling me I can go do it. So I kind of needed that permission a little bit, I think, right. from myself. Right. And so I started, I'd wanted to do it. And I had done a podcast for a friend who ran a show at the comedy store here in LA. And we'd finished podcast. He's like, you know, you're really funny. And if you can put together five minutes, I'll let you open my show. And I was like, yes, I would love to. So I was planning on doing it. And then I got booked for my first anal scene. That was supposed to be the day after this show. So I had to call him and be like, you know, I'm so sorry. I can't do it. Really bummed. Whatever. And then three days before my first anal scene, it was canceled. Um, I'm sorry. I can't do your comedy show. I have to spend all night cleaning out my ass. Right. That's all you have to say. I mean, there's your fucking material right there. Yeah, I was like, I can't. And so, well, I was like, you know, I can't, I can't do it and like whatever. And then like it gets canceled and like, it was a very abrupt cancellation. It was not a good situation. Um, I've now like repaired I feel like, the relationship. I feel like anal I feel like anal scene cancellations are like the most inconsiderate cancellations. Oh yeah, because the well, most amount of work, one. yeah, that you have to yeah. put into getting prepared for anal is like more work than the scene itself. Well, and the amount of work you have to put into selling your first anal at like a higher price, yeah, is it's really really hard to sell a first anything in porn anymore. Yeah, um, that's true. And we had spent four months. Five months by the time it was canceled, five months pitching it to and let them sit on it and wait and reschedule and like all of this stuff is just a nightmare. And so like it gets canceled. It was also the end of the month and it was like my rent money. <laughs> like, yeah. So I'm like losing my shit. I like ran around my house screaming for like 45 minutes, just crying, like just mess. And I was like, okay, what am I going to do? Because like after I like, you know do the screaming, the crying. I'm like, okay, how are we going to fix this? Like, we're going to salvage it. What are we going to do? And so I was like, hey, I'll call him. So I called him. I was like, hey, uh, I'm free on Sunday. Can I come do your show? And he's like, yeah, of course. So it's like two days before. So I had to write the, I only had like a day to write my entire set. Mm -hmm. Having never done standup, I'd never written standup. I had literally had to Google how to write standup comedy. <laughs> like, <laughs> but it was I, I'm so interested to know like actually what advice like what what did that say when it said like 
how to write stand up comedy? Like, what was what advice were you giving? Actually, stand up is actually really technical. Like, I later took a class about stand up. Um, the way you write it is very like you have to. And the first thing I read was that it's punch, punch, punch. So like, the first line is kind of funny. The second is funnier, and then the last thing of the story is the funniest. So you just write it in like three bits. It's like a haiku. Yeah, kind of. It, it's like, a lot. It is like a really certain pattern. Like poetry or anything else that's like written conversationally. And so yeah, because it's it's definitely about pacing and timing mm-hmm. for sure, and like delivery. Yeah. It's all. It's so interesting how two people can tell the same joke and how it's so so it different. So different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and two, like you have to cons- like even when you're writing it, like certain words are funnier. Certain words go with other words better. Like, Mm -hmm. because you're trying to create an image, like, um, Seinfeld says this about comedy. It's like a comic's job is to walk around the world and have experiences and be able to relate those experiences to anyone, to hundreds Mm -hmm. or thousands of people that have not had that experience. You have to be able to somehow get that image in their brain and get them to laugh at it. Right. Which is, go back to communication, is a huge part of that. Um, Right. So I, I mean, and, and looking back on this, I still have that set list. Like I typed it all out and I like spilled beer and coffee on it. Like I, it's all crumpled up and I was like, I'm going to keep this forever. Um, but, uh, I got super drunk. I called my mom, which I never do and was just like running around my house. I was like, okay, we're going to do, it. we're going to do it. So I went, I ended up writing this whole set about how my anal scene had gotten canceled. And I'm I was just going to say, like, you better talk about that. I mean, like, right. at least you have the fucking material. Oh, yeah. At least oh. you have a life that's interesting enough to talk about. Exa- so I was like, okay, yeah. I have all this like, material right up front. And, like, the joke, too, was that, like, because it had been canceled, the director said he didn't like my face. Wait, what? Uh-huh. Wait, okay. First of all, first of all, what the fuck? Second I know. Of all, Who tells somebody that that's the reason for cancellation? You don't say that. You just say like, I, my dog died. I don't know. You go up with something. We need to reschedule whatever. Oh my God. It was the most. And so it was the most like crushing thing too. Cause I was like, you know, you know what? And I fucking know who it is. Yeah. You know who it is. Yeah. I know who it is. Yeah. Yeah, Cause I think you may have said, you know, Dude, what a dick. That so, doesn't surprise me at all now yeah. that I remember who it is. Yeah. And yeah. It's, like it was just the most like it it really did like and I'm not someone that like like I take criticism fine. Like I read the comments on my scenes. Like I don't care. Like I really yeah. I a lot of times like when people say stuff I'm like, "Yeah, I see your point." Honestly, like my head is kind of weird shaped. It's okay. Um, <laughs> my one eye is a little lazy. I'm aware. Like it's not, yeah. I'm not like, thank you for pointing that out. I didn't know. <laughs> I like said that to most people who are like, Oh, I didn't even notice. And I said it to my mom one time. She's like, Oh yeah, it's the left one. I was like, oh, <laughs> cool. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks mom. It's technically your fault, but I was, it's okay. It really technically is. Cause I had astigmatism and my parents didn't get me glasses when I was little. <laughs> so there, and that's why you're important. <laughs> Um, they're very sorry, but they hate when I tell that story because <laughs> like it was, the, it was one of those like eye screenings like at school. Right. And like they came, I was like first grade, I was really little and they're like, Hey, like your daughter doesn't have good eyesight. And my parents neither wore glasses. My grandparents didn't like, no, it doesn't run our family. So they're like, that's dumb. Like they made a mistake. And then like yeah. a month later, my teacher like sent a note home and they're like, your daughter's eye is sinking back into its socket. Like you need to go take her to the like now because my eye had started it was like it's a it was astigmatism so my eye just started to like sink into it because the muscle wasn't like working correctly right enough. okay okay and yeah, so yeah. and it was like overcorrecting or something so like they finally like looked at my face and were like oh shit and then I had these super thick like coke bottle glasses <laughs> like bifocals it was like a tiny little old man I was like eight years old um if it makes you feel any better my parents are british so they didn't believe in braces which is why i had overbite and crooked bottom teeth they were like who cares about teeth (laughs) like it doesn't yep mm -hmm. they're very i think that's like it's such a generational thing too where they're just like this no like now i feel like if that happened it would be your parents would immediately take you 
you know? No, it's, it's legit. So it's like legit. So just like quick segue on British people and teeth. And like, obviously my parents are British. I'm an Anglophile. I fucking love England. I love British Mm -hmm. history. I love British people. I love all everything about it, but like they legit, and maybe this is like a fortunate thing because they're less concerned about, um, you know, that, that transient quality of how you Mm -hmm. look more than other people, but like, they don't give a fuck about teeth. They just don't. And I was married to a British guy actually. And I remember talking to him about it and I was like, why don't you guys care about teeth? He's like, why would I care about teeth? I'm like, why Mm -hmm. wouldn't you care about teeth? And we just had this argument about like how important teeth were. And like, he could not understand like why I thought good teeth were important. And like, I couldn't understand like why he didn't think it mattered. Mm -hmm. My dad is also British. So I, I, I get it. Like he also has bad teeth and I had bad teeth as well. I have veneers now. Um, cause I fell off my bike when I was a kid and like, this has turned from comedy into just like bad things that happened to me as a child, <laughs> which is most of my comedy. So, well, I was just going to say like most comedians are built from like traumatic childhood experiences. Oh, I feel, right. I feel like most personalities are built from traumatic childhood experiences. Yeah. So I feel like this part of the conversation makes sense. D- totally. And I think most people in porn are actually not as traumatized as people we usually think. Like most yeah. comedians that I know are way more fucked up and have way yeah. more fucked up lives than anyone yeah. I know in porn. Like by far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, we're all fucked up in one way or another, mm-hmm. you know? It's like you yeah. just people – we're human beings raised by human beings and, and we fuck yeah. up. Um, I have to – my my fucking computer battery is dying. <gasps> so hold on. Ernie, can you put a marker on this to cut this out? One second. I literally like let it get down to like 2% and then I'm like, yeah, I got it. I got it. Okay. Yay. Okay. We're good. Yay. Okay. Sorry. Mine is like squeegee Sorry. is right here next to me asleep, like in her kennel, which is why I keep huh? like, squeegee's right here next to me in her kennel, which is why like every time you break, I keep going down and being like, oh, hello. Good girl. I know. My dog Bonnie is right here. Oh, she's on the floor. Yep. Squee- this is Squeegee's house right here. So she's asleep. She sleeps all day in there. Oh, Squeegee. Yeah. Okay. What were we talking about? Uh, traumatic yeah. childhood and why it makes us funny. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So enough about um, our teeth. Yeah. Um, okay. Back to. Back to oh, okay. Funny. We were talking about comedy, people commenting about your eye. That's how we got yeah. all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Go on. I think you have to be able to laugh at yourself. And you have to be able to, like, look at the things that have happened to you. And, like, I've always been a person that just kind of naturally does that. Where, like, some – I haven't had the worst life. Like, a lot of – I've had a lot of privileges and, like, opportunities that – and, like, I'm very grateful for those. And I try to, like, own them and check them. But, like, I'm also a person that has objectively had some bad things happen to them. And, like, I've always been someone that kind of just looked at it overall and been like, okay, like, how do we take this thing that's, like, broken or crappy or bad and, like, turn it into something good? Mm -hmm. Like it's always just like working with what you have and like building something out of it, even when it really feels like you can't. And that's like a huge life motto of mine. Yeah. But it definitely informs a lot of my comedy where it's like the first thing that I think about when something bad happens to me is like, oh my God, where's the joke? Where's the punchline? Like it's it's here. It's here somewhere. Um, And it's a great way to deal with life too. Like humor isn't, is, is, you know, I think a currency that we all use to handle Mm -hmm. the hard times in life. Totally. And one back to like relating it to other people is that like, you know, when you're able to get up and say like, hey, this fucked up thing that happened to me today, guys, like this jackass canceled my first anal scene because he didn't like my face. And I just hate to split hairs, but I feel like my face was maybe not the focal point of that film. (laughs) And like, say what you want about my face. My butthole is fucking flawless. (laughs) Like, um. And, uh, but I think being able to talk about those things, like when you hear them, you know, outside of it, as long as like, you realize that these things happen to everybody and it's mm-hmm. not like, you know, you're not in particularly a bad person or an unlucky person or anything like these things just happen, you yeah. know? 
and we can't control them. And yeah. So anyway, like my whole comedy career got launched because this really terrible thing had happened to me. So I write this whole set about it and it just, it killed. And I was on that show at the comedy store for like six months and I was just doing it like, and I got to open for some really cool people and I got to meet a ton of people. And I just started going, I moved down to Hollywood because I'd been living in the Valley and I was going to so many mics like every night that I was like, this is, it's costing too much money. This is what I want to do. I'm going to be down here. I like got off of the stage that night and I was so high. I mean, there's no yeah. other way. It's just the most incredible high, especially the first time when you just kill and you're like, oh, if there's yeah. nothing that feels like it. And I like called my mom and I was like, I will do this for 40 years. Like I will wait tables. Like I'll do whatever. Like I just want to do this forever. Mm-hmm. And um, so I just started going around town and like doing this. I'm doing the set and then – I keep that joke. That's like my closer joke. And I did it in Vegas over AVN. And uh, this is a part of the story you haven't heard about yet, actually. So I went and I I got booked for a show during AVN. I went and did the comedy show, whatever. I did my set. It went well. And like a few days later, we all got home and I get a call from my agent. And he's like, Kate, did you tell a joke about this director? And I was like, yes. And he's like, his name in the set? Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah, I mean, it was it was a porn crowd. I was like, fuck it. And I was like, also, you're not going to hire me, so I don't give a shit. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You already said you don't right. like me, so whatever. Yeah. And, um, so I uh, – so I'm on the phone, and he's like – I was like, you've heard me tell this joke. Like, you've been to my show, dude. He's like, well, yeah. like, their new CEO is on the other line and would really like to talk to you. <laughs> I'm like, he's going to kill me. <laughs> my, my wonderful agent who I love so much is going to like murder. It's totally my fault. And um, I get on the phone and actually because the director that had said that is no longer employed in the industry at all, which was the other reason why I really felt like it was okay to say it because I was like, not even yeah. here anymore. And uh, so Renucio, who is a lovely, lovely person, was on the other line and goes, you know, he's apologizing because I'm so sorry. Like you should have never heard that. That should have never been said. That's bullshit. Like, we would love to hire you. And then he's like, please, will you pull this joke? Please stop saying this joke. <laughs> and I was like, no, I like all compromise. I was like, I will take his name out of the joke because it's not important to the joke. You don't need to yeah. hear it. So I won't say his yeah, name. Yeah. Well, I am going to keep it. And most joke. people who aren't in the adult industry won't know who he is anyways. It doesn't matter. I'm like, so. He, he doesn't think that, but. Most people don't know who he is. Most people, yeah, which is another one of my favorite, like, (laughs) things. And also just, I was like, I know, like, I'm doing this joke around town, like, for eight months. Like, there are now hundreds, if not thousands of people that have heard this joke and, like, think this guy is such an asshole. And I just get such a kick out of that. Like, all they know about him is that he canceled my first anal scene. (laughs) Um, Eat him up. Um, But, uh... So anyways, like he, you know, apologized and I was like, okay, cool, whatever. So I pulled him in the joke and they ended up hiring me uh, to do an anal scene a couple weeks later um, at Above My Ray. And when I showed up on set, their new CEO came to set and brought me a huge bouquet of flowers and was like, oh we're so happy to have you here. Like, thank you so much for giving us another chance. Just like was a wonderful experience. So like, not only did that terrible thing that happened to me turn into this great other career that I love, but like it also ended up fixing that relationship. Like it really did build into something from like very, very bad to an entirely good thing. Which so is- the lesson here is to just always call people out <laughs> and <laughs> make jokes about that and say their name. Is if you call people out and you're funny about like, I do notice people like, let me get away with saying so much shit that like even other girls in the industry aren't allowed to or supposed to say. Yeah, and I think it's just because everyone's like, "Oh, but she's a comedian." Like it doesn't. She's yeah, like, yeah, too. yeah. That's true. I'm sorry. I don't know when that last video cut out. Um, I'm doing. I'm doing my best, people. <laughs> I was just saying, there's no record like red button on the outside of this camera, so I have no idea if it's recording or not. So it might just be a lot of Kate, which is better, anyways, because <laughs> we like her face. Oh, thank <laughs> you guys. I love it. I appreciate it. Oh, God. <laughs> okay. Somebody kind of came after you on social yes. media a little while ago. She has a tendency to do that to she a is. lot of people. Yes. Um, I thought you responded really well, but basically yeah. she came out and just accused you of escorting. Yeah. And 
you responded very honestly that, that you had done that. And it was an mm-hmm. interesting thing for me because I've been in the industry a long time mm-hmm. and there was a time when it was perfectly acceptable for people to throw stones mm-hmm. from maybe glass houses yeah. um, where porn stars would talk about girls who escorted as like lower than them. Yeah. And it was very common to be like, I won't work with her because she's an escort or mm-hmm. she escorts on the side. Like she's dirty. I'm a porn star. It's different. Like, and yes, they are like different jobs mm-hmm. and, and yeah. there are different things that go with them. But I really love this way, the way that we have recently started to embrace everybody in the sex work community as part of one community. And even just yeah. the term sex worker is a new kind of a Mm -hmm. new term. It really is. So I love how you just kind of came out and had this very honest, you know, just did this very honest, like Mm -hmm. piece of camera. You're like, yeah, I used to escort and I'm not ashamed Mm -hmm. of it and I don't do it anymore. But like, you know, and, and, and it was great too, because like when somebody accuses you of something and you just own up to it, like it really takes the wind out of their sails. Like it's hard to try to shame somebody for something that they like will openly admit to and like refuse yeah. to be shamed about. And it was an interesting thing too, because like the girl that had, as she got mad at me over a completely unrelated joke that I made and I, uh, it, which like we don't need to get into, but it was to me, yeah. it was such a bizarre thing. Cause I was like, okay, like if you're mad about the joke, like fine attack me for the joke. Like, don't come after, like, that's just a fact about me. Yeah. Like, I'm not ashamed of it. And I think the, the hierarchy, and like you were saying, I think it's really great that that is changing and that porn, a lot of performers are actively trying to be a part of that solution. Cause I think in porn, especially professional porn, we have been very guilty of upholding the hierarchy for a long time mm-hmm. and feeling like we are better. And there's, you know, something to that. Cause it's like, you know, this is such a competitive industry. I get where it comes from. Mm-hmm. Like the mindset of being like, you know, porn is such a competitive industry. It really is kind of a rarefied group of like successful American full-time porn performers. Right. It's a very small pool. It's really difficult job, like career to get into. You have to work to get to it. And so we do see where it has that kind of like, and I have even been guilty of it before too, where like, especially with like cam girls and more like content creators, you know, being like, I don't want you speaking as a sex worker because you don't speak for me. And, you know, you just film yourself in your bedroom. And it that is a different thing. Like, it's important to acknowledge that like all kinds of sex work are valid there. Right. And because we all face a similar social stigma, because like, Somebody like a mom in the Midwest is not going to look at a porn star and an escort differently to her. They're both, you know, I don't know why I'm yeah. specifically choosing this person as an example, but to like a civilian. Yeah. Person. What do you, what do you get have against Midwest moms, Kate? I know. It's Cause I have one <laughs> <laughs> and she doesn't differentiate. <laughs> well, there you go. Okay. So you're basing this on actual like life experience. So <laughs> okay. Why you get away with that? My mom draws no difference between any kinds of sex work, which is, you know, something we're working on. Um, yeah. But, you know, like they're they're not viewed as different by the rest of society. And if we want to work to get the stigma around our industry as a whole diminished and changed and we want to be part of the solution, then we all have to work together. And it's OK right. to acknowledge that, like, there are inherently different risks, rewards, benefits, whatever, to being a cam model, a porn performer, an escort, whatever. But they are similar. And I was escorting when I lived in LA. Like I had just moved here and I did it for about like six months. And it was, uh, (laughs) this city's really expensive. (laughs) Like (laughs) it costs a ton of money to live here. If you do professional porn, you can't really have a day job. Like there are some people that do, but you pretty much have to work for yourself because you are so often called at like seven o'clock in the morning to go do a scene. Mm -hmm. So I was at a point where I was like, you know, I have to pay my bills. I have to pay my rent. Um, I don't get any money from my parents or from anyone else. Like that's something that apparently a few people thought about me, which is not, my parents do not support my lifestyle (laughs) in any way, emotionally or financially. And, um, so I was like, you know, I got to go figure this out. So I, yeah, I worked with an agency. Um, I did not have a bad experience. I, you know, I set my boundaries right away. I met some interesting people. I got to travel. Um, and I ended up stopping doing it. Like I said in the video, like I was dating somebody. 
And I learned this about myself that like, it turns out I'm actually a pretty monogamous person. Um, weirdly after all of this, <laughs> um, but, uh, it just became really hard on me, like emotionally and like mentally to create that kind of intimacy outside of that. And right. that was when I stopped doing it. And so like, I did it on my own terms. I stopped when I wanted to, and I never felt like I did anything that I didn't want to do, you know? Right. And the reality is too, that there are a ton of porn, uh, porn performers that do private bookings still. Mm -hmm. I don't look down yeah. on them. I mean, I make my judgments based on like who I'm going to work with, like off of, you know, knowing them as people off of like the, off of their social media presence. Obviously, like, there are people even right now. And, you know, we're saying this on Twitter. Like if I there's a, an FSC production hold right now, mm -hmm. we're all in quarantine. If I see you shooting content right now, you're on my no list mm -hmm. like forever, because if you can't abide by like that, like our literal like trade organization mandate, I don't know what else you're not abiding by. Mm. Well, you know what's interesting? You're you're right. There is a yeah. there's a mandatory production hold from FSC while they were like retesting. There was something in Pass that was going on, and for those of you who don't know, yeah. Pass is our testing system. Mm -hmm. um, they had to like retest some people. There was some they like, ran the test differently at one of the labs in Florida. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, but so then, there was no positive, but they needed to rerun all the tests. Right. Sure and then once, I don't know if they've finished all of that, but it's interesting mm -hmm. because once that is over, it's actually a voluntary production hold. They're not doing mandatory yeah. because of the coronavirus, mm -hmm. which I find to be interesting, which whatever, but yeah. I, I think pretty much most people are abiding by it. But I will say, mm -hmm. cause I actually did get in like a little bit of a Twitter argument about this the other day. Mm -hmm. And I kind of I definitely regret getting into it because normally I keep my fucking mouth shut and I think <laughs> I've just been going stir crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, and I voice my opinion about something that I shouldn't have. And, and my motives were, were, it was a different reason. It wasn't actually yeah. about quarantine and stuff, but basically what I had seen was there was this gossip adult blog site mm -hmm. that, you know, loves to just bash other people. Yeah. And they took this couple who was advertising um, a live show that they were doing and they mm -hmm. posted about them and were like, these two people don't care about the quarantine. They said, fuck the production hole, blah, 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 blah. Well, mm -hmm. these two people, I am like 99.9% .9 sure they're a couple and they cohabitate. Yeah. So I saw Which that. Is they post which is fine. You were, they're fucking together oh, anyways. Yeah. But like all of these people, this person just sloppy reporting. All of these people jumped on yeah. it. And we're like, fuck these people. Mm -hmm. And what annoyed me too, was that they didn't like defend themselves. They just like deleted the tweet, which was weird to me. Yeah. So I was coming from that where I was just annoyed mm -hmm. by like people like policing each other and just yeah. like having anyways. So that's where I came from. So I don't know where I was going with that. But, um, everyone's anyways. in different like situations with this. And like, yeah. yeah, once the mandatory hold is called off, like I, I recognize that everyone's in different situations. Like this hold, this whole quarantine thing is, I mean, a lot of my friends are really hurting right now. Yeah. You know, I feel really fortunate to not be in a position where like, I feel like I need to go out and shoot right now, but I know that not everybody, not even the majority of people are in that position. Yeah. And so, that's the thing. I think like a lot of us who make a lot of money on our content mm -hmm. platforms think that everybody is and yeah. not everybody is. So, um, that was just kind of my point. Like my whole yeah. thing was like, you don't know situations that other people are in. And yeah. I really like throughout my life, I've tried to teach myself to come from a place of compassion and trying to understand that I don't know what other people are going through and I don't know what their situation is and I should reserve judgment Mm -hmm. on those people for that. But I've also should have reserved judgment on the person who was judging the people that I felt they should have reserved judgment on. And just like, it's none of my business. Cause I, I was like, it's none of your business, but like, it was none of my business. <laughs> Anyways, I've been getting in a lot more. Twitter make arguments lately. Fun. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing. Like, I think like we're I'm all just at home, home and we have nothing to do, but like see what yeah. everybody else is up to and like, be like, you're a bad person. But like, right. And it, like I have seen because there are a lot of porn couples that do cohabitate and are still like shooting content with each other right now, which like fucking yeah. obviously like, dude, if I had yeah. like a guy, like if I had something else here, to do, yeah, yeah, I would totally be fucking. I'm yeah. super single and live alone. Um, yeah. 
But like, I've also seen people on Twitter who I will not name being like, who wants to come over and shoot some content today? Like, who wants to yeah. come over? And I'm like, no. Like, that's, yeah. you know, or people that are saying like, you know, this is bullshit. Porn shouldn't be shut down for this. Like, th- the whole world is shut down right now. Yeah. It is. It sucks. Yeah. It sucks yeah. for everybody. But like this idea that like, and I do, I mean, this is kind of something because I'm the same way. I always try to like consider the circumstance someone's coming from. But like I do get very he, just irritated and very frustrated with this idea that – and sometimes it just kind of seeps in where like there are so many people that think they just like deserve a career in this mm. industry. And like that they – Well, I, I think it's also – I think it's a generational entitlement thing too. Mm-hmm. Like – no, I mean, I know you're you're younger and yeah. you're kind of in that generation, but I do feel mm-hmm. that and all the other little tabbers like myself, um, <laughs> we do feel that there is a serious like sense of entitlement among yeah. the youth of today and where everybody thinks that I think because of the instant gratification that comes from the internet, mm-hmm. that comes from fucking reality TV, that comes from postmates, um, that like Amazon we should Prime. all I should get anything Be super immediately. right right now. Um, I think it comes and from that, and I also think it comes from just our cultural perceptions of porn as being something yeah. that anyone can do. That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, there's very much, and I see it all. And usually, these are the people that end up like running into trouble in the industry and not having careers <laughs> because yeah. they're like, you know. And I see people like complain about it on Twitter, like why the fuck is this girl? And every once in a while, someone will pop off on it and be like, why the fuck does so-and-so work all the time? And why does this person get to do this? And why doesn't this company not hire me? And it's like, if they're not hiring you or you don't feel like you're getting enough work, then like you need to go. I mean, sometimes that it's just unfair. Yes, Mm -hmm. absolutely. Like this, this industry is not fair. Neither is the world. And like, sometimes you're just not going to get what you want. But also like, if you're not getting what you want and you feel like your career is not moving forward or going the direction you want, then like you need to address that and fix it Mm -hmm. because blaming everybody else is not going to get you where you, like, I've been in that position where I've definitely felt that way. Like, you know, why isn't this site hiring me? Why am I not working for this person? And I just had to go back and look and be like, oh, it's because I'm not a big enough name yet or I don't, you know, have that kind of audience or maybe I don't have that right look. Like I have to go change these things about myself because that's my career. Yeah. And I think it's hard to, I think just in general working in the entertainment industry mm-hmm. where a lot of being in front of the camera, where a lot mm-hmm. of your value is on your looks. Like that's yeah. really hard because that's not something that you can necessarily change a whole lot. No, I mean, you can do some things obviously, yeah. but you know, it's yeah. like if you're a really terrible basketball player, like mm-hmm. you, well, some people are just not destined to do yes. certain things, but like, you know what I mean? Like you could work mm-hmm. on certain things yeah. and improve a skill. Whereas like the way that you look is kind of, mm-hmm the way that you look. And if you do too much to try to change it, then you sometimes you just end up looking weird. Yes, totally. You know what I mean? I mean, there's things where it's like, you know, if you want to do like a lot of like Whitney Wright's a really great example of this. I just worked with mm-hmm. her. I just like one of the last scenes I shot with before going into quarantine. And I really like working with her, but I also really just like her as a performer because she's somebody that wanted to do and like is very specific and open about this where she's like, I wanted to do bigger narrative driven production. So yeah, like with Whitney, she's somebody that went back and watched all of her scenes and became really Mm -hmm. critical about her performance and her acting and worked on it and got to do those kinds of movies because she was active and went and did something. And like for me personally, like, and I tell new girls this all the time, like comedy has been the single best thing that has improved my porn career. It wasn't intended to, but it was because I started to get mainstream exposure. I started to get my name out there. More people started to know who I was. And all of a sudden- My rankings went up. I started working more. I started working for the kinds of companies I'd wanted to work for. I got to be choosier about my work. You know, it was because I went out and did something else and created like a brand and had a plan and thought about like how this is what I want. How do I go get it? Because I'm not just going to sit here and hope that eventually someone will come hand it to me. Yeah. And comedy Mm -hmm. is one of those things that I've noticed is something that you generally like 
don't just succeed at right away. Mm -hmm. Like almost nobody is like, just comes on the scene and is like a huge Mm -hmm. comedy star. And if you look at, um, you know, some comics, like early material. Like I remember yeah. watching like an early stand up with Louis CK and he was terrible. Yeah. It was so bad. And if I had seen that guy, like at a comedy club, mm-hmm. you know, me not really knowing anything about comedy and how you like cultivate your craft, I would have mm-hmm. been like, this guy should just give up now. You know what I mean? And like, yeah. he's one of my favorite comedians. I mean, I know he masturbates in front of girls, but I pay people to masturbate in front of me. So I guess I right. didn't take it as personally as as maybe some other people did, but like, I love him. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it, it's definitely one of the, and from mm-hmm. com- comedians that I've spoken to, they're like, it's, a, it's a craft that you yeah. have to hone and you have to look at it and you for have to like, like test out years. jokes and like, yeah. And, for 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. And, and not as long, but porn is really like that too. Like, I yeah. think we get in this headspace where, especially cause you know, you do have a once in a while, you'll get like a brand new girl who just boom. Take oh, off. totally. That's if you're exactly. beautiful and you're like yes. sexy, I mean, yeah. you know, like, first of all, if you're beautiful and you have a perfect body, even yeah. if you kind of are a terrible are performer, terrible. like you're still going to do <laughs> yeah. pretty well, you but know? There are so many people that don't, and it takes a really long time for them. Like we were saying, like Angela White's been yeah. doing this for 15 years, 15 years yeah. ago. She wasn't Angela White the way we know her today. You know, she right, worked right. really hard. And the vast majority of people that have like longevity in their careers in porn and have mm-hmm. significant success are not people that came in and right away were boom, you're great. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. That's you kind of, you have I to think struggle also, a little bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think it also like makes you see the value in when you actually do reach those heights totally. because if you know, you know how like you appreciate things if you, the harder you work for them, the more you appreciate them mm-hmm. when you have them. Yeah. So being in like this position now, like even with the quarantine and and not being able to shoot and still having like the fact that I still have income right now is enormous and it's not lost on me at all because even six mm. months ago, I would have been in a completely different financial situation had something like this happened. And so it really does change and like, I think inform your perspective in a really important way to Mm -hmm. have been there where you weren't, because it gives you a lot more empathy for the people. Yeah. You know, then you're able to be like, okay, yeah, like I'm doing well, but I remember when I wasn't. And I've always tried to be the kind of person that I needed or wanted when I was first starting, like I try to think back and be like, okay, what, what did I want to know? Um, who, what, like what questions did I have? Like, who did I want to like look up to or emulate? Like who was somebody that I, you know, wanted to be. And so like, now I look back and like, that's always like my goal, especially for like new performers. Cause I do like, I really try to reach out. Like I always am very open about it on Twitter. Like my DMS are always open to new performers. Like I haven't been in the longest. I'm not the most successful, but I, I can and want to help, you know? So then what would be like your key pieces of advice to newcomers? What is maybe one of the things that you learned that you feel like is something that new people should really do? And maybe what is one thing you've learned that new people really shouldn't do? So this is a really great segue too, because this is my new site that I'm launching. No, oh, keep talking. Cool. No, I was going to say keep talking because he's going to cut to you. I just need to check the camera because I don't trust it. <laughs> cool. Um, so this is a great segue because this is what my new site is about that I'm like about to launch. And it's just a whole site of essay content, blog content, video content um, that's aimed at one, my thoughts on the industry and just kind of, you know, general interest stories, but a lot of it is for new performers um, to give them that kinds of advice that I wish I had had. Um, The first biggest thing that I wish I had known is that you absolutely should not move to Los Angeles and try to become a professional porn performer if you have no other savings or income. Don't do that. It's a terrible idea. Um, (laughs) If you want to get into porn and you want to like go pursue the adult industry, start at home, start with your own content. You don't have to do any of your firsts at home. You don't have to do your first boy girl or whatever, which by the way, is like very little cachet anyways anymore. Um, But you don't have to do that. 
Um, start building up your own content from home. Fucking cam, do your OnlyFans, do whatever. Make some trips out to LA. Try test shooting. See if you like it, first of all, because you might not. And uh, and go slowly. And then once you have those income streams and savings that are stable, if you still want to move out here and do it, by all means, please come out. I will buy you a beer and I would be happy to as long as you're over 21. Um, which is the second thing that I think I would say performers should not do is uh, don't get into porn when you're 18. Right out of high school. Don't do it. I know that you think that you're going to like have a ton of work because you're 18 and you're super hot and your skin is never going to look better than it does right now, by the way, just so you know. Um, (laughs) I'm almost 26 and I know. Go out and get a regular world job for a little while. Go to school. Go try to figure out who you want to be. And if you still want to do it in a couple of years, come out. You're still going to be hot when you're 21. So... But give yourself time, like let yourself be an adult before you join the adult industry. Your advice about not moving out to moving out to LA right away, I thought it was really smart. Yeah. Because you're right. It's very expensive. Because <laughs> I did it and it was a mistake. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh and then yeah, the the don't start porn when you're 18. That's you know, it's a that's a conversation I've had with so many different yep. people. Some people totally agree with you, some people mm-hmm. don't agree with you. It's I think. I think probably in general, it's better if you can mm-hmm. afford to wait. It's usually better to wait because yeah. it is a decision that is going to affect you for the rest, the rest of your, of your life. life. You know, yeah. There is a real stigma in it mm-hmm. and um, it will follow you. So you want to make sure that this is something that you definitely want to do mm-hmm. and that you're comfortable with all of the repercussions that come yep. with it. It's just it's just a fact. Well, um, and that you're able to, because that's not, it's a difficult job. Like, and when you're 18 yeah. and you're, you're so young and like, I look back at when I was, I was 18 and like, I wouldn't have been able to like be my own advocate for myself on set. Yeah. I wouldn't have been comfortable setting boundaries for like my body and myself and what I do and don't want to do against, you know, men that are like twice as old as me. You know, yeah. and in, in a production company where, you know, there's tons of money riding on this and like, you know, you're going to get yourself into situations and being able to take care of yourself in those is a skill. And it's a skill that comes from being in business in any regard. But right. the stakes are so much higher in porn that like, even if you, I think we should raise the shooting issue to 21. That's my personal feeling. I know that not everyone agrees. I would even be cooler with you getting in at 19 than 18, you know, just take a real time. You have to live outside of your parents' house and go figure out, like I went and, you know, went to college, tried to do a stint in the real world. I hated it. Like, but I went and tried it and I'm really glad I did. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's one of those things. Like, I mean, there's a couple of people, but only a couple of people that I can name that got into 18 and like made the right decision and and yep. came in with a sound mind and knew exactly what they were doing. The two people that come to mind right away is actually Sasha Gray and Abella Danger. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's just like off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. But then it's just, then we run into that argument. And then this is a whole other like yeah. thing. Um, if you can sign up, for the army and die for your country at 18, you should be able to do porn. But then you also yeah. maybe I feel like shouldn't be able we'll to just sign up army. for the army. <laughs> I also like, don't think that we should go to war and kill other people yeah. too. <laughs> so in general, yeah, I, it, just in general, I just like, yeah. I'm not into like violence. And mm-hmm. now every person who was ever in the military, who's watching this on YouTube, I'm going to get <laughs> so many comments. You know, what's kind of funny is that, um, on my, on my audio channel, like on my Apple podcasts, I have, I don't know, I have a bunch of reviews and almost yeah. all of them are like really, really nice. And the few that aren't are people who are like really mad when I, uh, said that, like, I didn't like, I think that there should be like stricter gun laws. <laughs> like all of my bad reviews come from like three people who are really, really angry at like my view on guns. Right. So, um, I know that, you know, and, and, and look like obviously people who have served in the military and people who have fought for our yeah. country, like it's, it's an amazing thing to do and, and what a selfless totally. thing to do. Yeah. And I cannot even possibly imagine yeah. what that must be like. Um, 
My so problem is anyway. the system, not the individual. Yeah, exactly. Like my problem is with the politicians that are sending young people to, to die, die. their country, yeah. not that's, that's um, my fucking issue. people who are doing the dying because that's some yeah. fucked up shit. I just saw 1917, by the way, and wow, that was a really good movie. Have you seen that? I have not seen it. I saw, I watched Parasite, which I loved. Um, oh, yeah, that was great. I have not, I missed it. So I usually go to the movie theater in Las Feliz because that's where I live. And uh, I they have like the cheaper Wait, movie did you just theater. say Las Feliz? Okay, that is technically how <laughs> you're supposed to pronounce it. I got into an argument. This is the second argument that I was because my sister also lives in Los Feliz. Los Feliz is the way, which is like the whitest way to pronounce it. It is incorrect. It should be. Los I guess Feliz. actually that's true because it's, Feliz is Spanish. Yeah, it's very much so. Spanish. But Los Feliz, and I like will I mix them up all the time. And yes, people that live here that also live here constantly are on my case. I go to that movie theater because it's cheaper. It's like eight dollars. <laughs> And they only have like three movie screens and like you were, there's only like 40 other people there. So I fucking love it. And it's like across the street from one of my favorite bars. So I'll like go have a drink and then go to the movies by myself. And I was going to go because it was playing there and then this happened. So I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. Well, it's on uh, whatever Apple yeah. TV or anyways. Mm-hmm. Anyways, it's sorry. It's an amazing movie. We are <laughs> totally getting off. People are like, I am here to hear about porn, not about like your fucking movie <laughs> choices right. sorry people we'll go back to talking about dicks and vaginas because we don't know anything about anything else <laughs> but back to yeah like new performers in general and um but yeah that's the site that i'm launching is is for all of that and um because it's something that i'm really passionate about and i think that there are even without raising the shooting age which like ideally i would love to see obviously my opinion. Yeah, but that's never going to happen. Never going to happen. And outside of like, instead of, you know, sitting around and like I was saying, wishing that someone was going to come fix it for me. Like, I think yeah. there are a lot of like really concrete ways that like as performers, we can like contribute to helping because a huge part of this that's always bothered me is that there's no job training in porn. <laughs> Like you just like you get out here in you're in a, an enormous city, probably very far away from home. You don't know anybody and you're just expect you're just like thrown into the water. And mm. like, so like no other job works that way. <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy. Like yeah. we definitely need some kind of handbook or yeah, not that everyone's going to read it, but, you know, some people are going to read it. Some people are going to read it. And if the, the goal for me is always to just like disseminate the information as efficiently as possible. So if we can get like a few people, right. And then yeah. the people that won't read it, but hopefully they meet the people that did. And then they ask them questions. Cause I mean, that's how I mm-hmm. learned how to do it is I like knew a couple of girls that had been in it longer and I just would ask them all of these questions. I mean, that's how you do it is you kind of yeah. like meet other, especially other women in the industry. And like, you, you know, that's who you call when you're like, how do I do anal prep? <laughs> how do I, yeah. you know? And um, so to be able to, because the reality is that not everybody's going to have those people, especially right off the bat. And usually you make most of your mistakes at first. Mm-hmm. So if we're able to kind of catch those people right as they're coming in and give them mm-hmm. this and be like, hey, here's a really simple, like, here's all the questions you could possibly have. And here's a really mm-hmm. simple, like fun, engaging way to learn them or to have this resource that you can even just go, you know, check on when you have a question. I think that would make an enormous difference. But I think like the change in the industry has to come from the performers, you know, stepping up and saying like, we're going to take care of each other. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's happening more. I think, you know, I think social media has encouraged Mm -hmm. um, a community and dialogue where Mm -hmm. people are, um, you know, they are, they're helping each other out. And there's always people willing to give advice. Cause I think, you know, ultimately, you know, a girl or a boy mm-hmm. doesn't want other people to have the bad experiences that they had, you know, totally. like the mistakes that they made. Cause you know, you hear a lot, especially like the girls who got into the industry before kind of social media came along and before they really had those resources to learn things like the stories that I've heard in my career from girls mm-hmm. who, when they first start get caught up with some shady agent or mm-hmm. just like absolutely like unbelievably horrific and I'm like yeah. sometimes I'm like I can't believe this is my industry you know I mean I yeah. can't believe it but like the world that I operate in is so mm-hmm. different that yeah. when I hear those stories it's just like it's so infuriating yeah 
And almost every time I hear one of those stories, like, and this is not to like victim blame at all, because obviously mm-hmm. it's not your fault if something terrible happens to you. But like almost every single story I've ever heard that was like that, like there was definitely a point in it where like you could have changed the outcome. And it sucks to have to think that you are responsible to do that. But like, well, we all have to take responsibility in the things that happen to us. Otherwise, if you just sit around and play the victim the whole time, you're never going to change anything. Exactly. And I take responsibility for our actions. I'd so much rather be the person that like, you know, stands up for myself and like says something and, and avoid and changes the outcome or changes the Mm -hmm. scenario than have the terrible thing happen to me. And I think most people are like that, you know? Yeah. Um, so there, yeah, there's almost always, I almost always, when I hear those stories, see a very clear path that could have avoided that. Yeah. You know, if you'd had whatever different. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, sorry, now we're on like such a sad topic. Like there's always like that collateral, but you just try to minimize it, I guess, as much as you can. And like my, my own like thing like ethos is always just kind of like do as much as you can for as many people as you can for as long as you can. And just in any way, like you can use your talents and your platform to help. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's why, that's why you and I are like sitting here talking right now, like this discussion (laughs) that we're having right now between us, which I'm going to put on the internet and broadcast for people is, is what, you know, I think will help new girls and anybody else looking to the industry guys too. I don't want to just say girls because I always say girls. Yeah. I'm always thinking of like the women because sometimes yeah. they have a harder time, but like mm-hmm. guys too, you know, all of these yeah. things that you can learn from my show yeah. and people like Kate <laughs> and the website that she's going to come out with. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, the resources are there now they're, they're there. So yeah. people, people can change, we can change I mean, you, people like, people like you and I, but like, seriously, we're actively like trying to do our part to change yeah. the experience of people who come into our industry. Cause I yes. think, you know, you and I both want to have a better, a safer workplace for people. Totally. Porn's not going away. It's just not like it, everybody out there is trying to abolish porn. Like that's just not happening. I'm sorry. It's just not going away. So let's like try to make it a better place. Let's like yeah. be like, okay. Like this thing is always going to exist. Even if you hate it, let's try to make it safer and better for people. Yeah, exactly. It's the same logic behind like clean injection, like safe injection sites. Like, yeah, you know, for drug, like I hate to compare porn to drugs. because Yeah, great. I was like, wow, that's a terrible comparison. <laughs> I know it really, but like it is, it's but a I good hear you. comparison in that it's like one of those things yeah. that is always going to exist and has always existed. And we're not going to, stamping it out is not going to fix the problem. Yeah. You know, like addressing it and trying to take away like the the situations in which those bad things can happen is the way we're going to fix it because we can't just get rid of it. It's part right, of our right. society. It's a it's a part yeah. of our like innate human like humanity is that right. we love we love fucking and we love watching other people fuck. <laughs> like yeah, but since this the beginning true. of time, people were like in caves, like drawing porn on the wall. Like it's not going to go away. Yeah. 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 All right, Kate. Well, thank you so much. This has been great. We went on really long. I feel like just because I'm like at home and not in my studio, I'm just like, we can talk forever. And I'm pretty sure like my husband would like to come downstairs and start working <laughs> on his vegetable garden um, because I sequestered him upstairs until we were done. So <laughs> that is awesome. I know. I think, uh, well, Squeegee's still asleep and I don't, she's no, oh. No, you're just gonna roll over. Okay. Well, <laughs> Aww, squeegee. I know she's she's a cool babe. This was awesome. I'm really glad that we got an opportunity to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm glad that your video worked out for most of it because it's gonna be mostly you because mine kept cutting out. But whatever. Um, can you tell everybody? Uh, plug all your pluggables. Uh, yes. Where can they find you online? All that stuff. You can find me on Twitter at the OG Kennedy. You can also find me on Instagram at the underscore. OG Kennedy because the other one was taken. Um, and my new website, which is launching in a couple weeks, is called semiprocockjockey.com. I love it. That's Thank such you. a great name. Thank you. Can you believe that domain was just available? That, yeah, that is uh that is a good one. That is definitely a good <laughs> one. And you guys, as always, can follow me on Instagram and on Twitter at Holly Randall. 
And my YouTube channel is youtube.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. If you are listening to this on an audio platform, if you're watching this on YouTube, this is also available on an audio platform, any podcast platform. I'm on all of them. I have a Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash Holly Randall unfiltered. And of course, just my website, Holly Randall unfiltered for all, all podcast things. And, um, thanks for putting up with us and, um, this, very special coronavirus version of Holly Randall Unfiltered. And Kate, again, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. This was the highlight of my week by far because it's the only time I've gotten to interact with another human being. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. All right, guys. See you next week. Bye.